Guten Morgen, Jenny hier. Ihr schaut den Einmischen-Podcast, hier wird Politik betreut. Und wenn ihr die heutige Folge unterstützen wollt, liked, teilt und abonniert diesen YouTube-Kanal. Andere Möglichkeiten findet ihr in den Shownotes, Steady, PayPal, Überweisung oder meine allseits beliebte Wunschliste gefüllt mit Büchern und Dingen, die wirklich Spaß machen. Und in diesem Sinne entlasse ich euch in die heutige Folge. Habt viel Spaß, gebt mir Feedback, kommentiert. Ich würde mich sehr freuen. Bis bald. Hello, dear listeners and maybe uh, watchers. I'm happy to greet my guest today, who's called Luis Quintana Murci. Hello. Hello. And you are a French-Spanish biologist and population genetist. Known for your research on human evolution, population, genomic diversity and its relationship with immune diversity and infectious diseases. Right. Uh, I learned you have a podcast too. It's all in French. I didn't really understand much because my French, uh, it's more or less 20 years ago since I talk trench so what is your podcast about well my podcasts are basically related to my courses because uh besides my laboratory is in the pasteur institute here in paris uh, i'm also a professor in an institution that is called the college de france and uh, uh, all my courses are recorded and are intended not for specialists, geneticists or biologists, are intended uh, to be for a broad public, which includes scientists uh, from other fields, but also non-scientific people. So my, my broadcasts are about topics in human evolution, in genetics, in how we can adapt to the environment, and how our genes Uh, more or less can make us different in terms of uh, susceptibility to some infectious diseases. Which role does this medium podcast play for science communications? Exactly. Uh, they are mostly for scientific, they are intended for scientific communication and to make available to the community, to the society, to the non scientist the latest research yeah okay um i just learned that you are based in the pastor institute i'm pretty sure you know about the um history between pastor institute and the Koch institute in germany of course <laughs> where long standing competitors and that start with louis pasteur and, and robert Koch, actually but i think today things are not anymore like that i mean So, no, but but the I Germans hope. back then were re very um, jealous. Exactly. I think jealousy and competition in science is starting to go down. And I think there's more and more, more and more sense and an awareness that we should all collaborate and we should just calm down a bit. And that's the only way to advance science. I think this strict system or of a strong com uh, com how to say a strong competition publish and stuff like that is a starting to be questioned seriously um so it's really good that the germans and the french ended their erbfeindschaft in the last century uh, so their hereditary enmity so okay. when we always uh, killed each other in wars. Yeah, okay. I think now, fortunately, we are in a period of rather a German-French friendship, right? Yeah, that's true. I got your book, Die große Odyssee, wie die Menschheit über die Erde verbreitet, wie, wie sich die Menschheit über die Erde verbreitet hat, vom uh, CH Beck Verlag. It will be published on March 14th and will cost 28 euros in hardcover format in Germany and my listeners and watchers can find it in the show notes so where do we start this 
Odyssey? Well, that depends on the time depth where we want to be. But let's say that for us humans, the Odyssey started in Africa around 200,000 years ago, where Homo sapiens was born. I read in your book that our ancestors left Africa some 60,000 years ago. Exactly. And that every human being is in that context a migrant. How does this great migration shape our genome? Yeah, I mean, uh, as I was telling, so our species Homo sapiens originated in Africa uh, around 200,000 years ago. We still don't know where exactly. For a long time, people thought that our ancestors originated in East Africa, but still it remains to be confirmed. And, and we left Africa, our ancestors left Africa, as you were saying, 60,000 years ago, to very quickly people Europe and Asia uh, around 50,000 years ago. Then much later, around 20,000 years ago, they crossed the Bering Strait in the north of Asia to enter the Americas. And then there were regions of the globe that there were people by humans relatively recently, like the Southeast Pacific, Polynesia in particular, that is just over the last two, three thousand years that humans uh, were there before they were now humans. So the short answer to your question, what's the legacy of this uh, first major migration that is when our ancestors left Africa 60,000 years ago. So the legacy of that is that all of us of non-African ancestry, we are a kind of subset of African genetic diversity. In other words, we are all Africans in our roots. And since a group of African ancestors left Africa 60,000 years ago, that made that there was what we call a bottleneck. It's not all Africans left Africa. So just a group of Africans left Africa. So this group of Africans, since it was just a group, had less genetic diversity. So the result of that is that all humans that today live outside Africa have less genetic diversity than African populations. So I learned that there are the purest Homo sapiens. Which are the purest Homo sapiens which it's, are alive today? It's very difficult to talk about purest because what does it, it mean? I mean, it might have some negative connotations, a bit like eugenic or I would say even Nazi. So I wouldn't talk about purist. What I would say is that uh, non-African populations, we have in our genomes segments that come from other forms like Neanderthals, right? Whereas uh, African populations, most of their genome is purely, in brackets, homo sapiens. Yes, and I didn't want to imply that uh, it's something like race, science. But there is a part in this book who, which talks about 100% homo sapiens, which are exactly those who live today in Africa. Sure. And here is a part which talks about um, in case some white supremacists want to use race ideology. So sure. if you want to tell them, yeah, but you are not pure homo sapiens, the Africans are. Sure. That's an argument. <laughs> It's an argument that, of course, I wrote in the book. I'm not super fan of that argument, despite I wrote it. Uh, because I, in general, I don't like to mix scientific results and genetics with racism. Uh, 
but I mean, it's something racism exists, right? Mm-hmm. And uh, and it was just a little kind of joke to for white white supremacists like calm down. Uh, actually, they are more Homo sapiens than you are, because for those in the audience that are not aware of that, it's important to remind that when humans left Africa, uh, they encounter other human forms in Eurasia that today have disappeared, like Neanderthals in Europe and also Denisovans, that is a kind of cousin, let's say, of Neanderthals in East Asia. So thanks to the genetic studies, uh, today we know that our ancestors uh, admix it in Eurasia with these two different groups uh, that disappear in between 20,000 and 40,000 years ago. So for a few thousand years, in Eurasia, there was at least three three groups of humans: Homo sapiens, Neanderthals, and Denisovans. And we know that we had mixed it with them because today all of us in outside Africa, we do have in our genome, you, me, everybody that is of non-African ancestry around 2 to 3% of DNA that is coming from Neanderthals. Uh, my next question will go in this direction, but I got the joke and I found it funny and I just wanted to use it here in the podcast as well. Sure. So I, le- I learned, not just now, but in the book, that every human being, at least those not of African descent, has one to three percent genetic material from Homo neanderthalensis, or in the case of the Dionovans, up to six percent of genome in their DNA today. Uh, that's in uh, in Asia. So, how did this happen? And um, a follow-up question, what does it, does it do for our health today? Okay, how this happened? This is just the product of hybridization, what we call it mixture also. The first humans that uh, arrive in Europe encounter Neanderthals. They, get, For example, let's take the example of Neanderthals. They hybridize with them. They have children, they had children. And the reason why we know that is because we have, as you were saying, in between one and three percent of our present day genomes that comes from Neanderthals. This shows that in the past 40, 50,000 years ago, we admix it with them. So, in terms of Denisovan, is the same thing. Today, East Asian populations have on the top of the 2-3% of Neanderthal ancestry, on the top of that, they can have, let's say, 1% of Denisovan ancestry in their genomes in East Asia. But if you go to the Southeast Asia and regions like Papua New Guinea or the Solomon Islands in the Pacific, what we used to call Melanesia, they can have 4-5% of Denisovan ancestry, right? So what this Neanderthal ancestry, and in the case of Asia, Denisovan ancestry, how does it affect our present day life and our present day health? So the Denisovan segments in our genomes are known to affect multi- multiple functions that goes from skin pigmentation to some dermatological phenotypes, to also uh, neuronal development, uh, also can affect our metabolic uh, functions, and also it can affect uh, our immunity, the way we uh, react against infectious agents. So despite this not a lot, one to three percent, 
it's is concentrated in functions that today they are of major importance for our health. How do adaptations which helped our ancestors to survive end up as male adaptations today? Because uh, just uh, to tell tell you this, I heard a episode of the daily podcast from the New York Times and they talked about this uh, human group which settled in Europe um, and in in the region of Ukraine a few thousand years ago and uh, they talked about this uh, genome um, makeup that they had which adapted them to live uh, like um, in the steppes and with a lot of animals on the way. So they were really good adapted in immunity. So you can fight off diseases which come from these animals. But that this in our modern days functions in such a way that autoimmune diseases are more frequent today absolutely this is very important because this is something that we show like 10 years ago also that there are many because when we left africa we had to adapt to different climates we had to adapt to these different nutritional resources and we had to adapt to different pathogens so they were mutations that were selected through natural selection and allow us to have an immune system that was allowing to, to fight the new viruses or the new bacteria we we're finding through our migrations throughout uh, Eurasia. But this was an adaptation that was useful at that time, right? But since then, the environment has changed. Since then, all these mutations that were advantages with a change in lifestyle, with a change in environment, with the arrival of vaccines and antibiotics and the improvement of hygiene, the same mutations can today become maladapted. Let me give you two examples. One example is related to infectious diseases, as you were saying. There's mutations that in the past were good, were advantages, because they made that our immune system was really fighting very strong against infectious agents. But when you remove a bit all those infectious agents, the same mutations that were advantages in the past, because make that you had a very strong immune response, today can turn around you. Over-aggressive. Exactly. And make that these same mutations are responsible for the increased incidence of autoimmune disorders, auto inflammatory disorders, allergy, examples like Crohn's disease, inflammatory bowel disease, or multiple sclerosis, right? Let me give you another example that is not related to infectious diseases and immunity. For most of our life, as a species, we have been living in famine with really few, few, very little food right? So we have selected mutations throughout history that with very little food allow us to metabolize that and maximize the energy intake to survive. But then when you change the environment and when you allow populations to eat a lot, the same mutations that in the past allow us to survive in periods of prolonged famines, mm. today can be responsible for some traits like obesity, hypertension, and diabetes. What are archaic deserts? Okay. Archaic deserts are that in our genome, I was telling you that around from 1% to 3% of our genome outside Africa is of Neanderthal ancestry. But 
archaic deserts or Neanderthal deserts in this case is regions of the genome that are never of Neanderthal ancestry and which are where are located in our genomes today, these archaic deserts. They are mainly located in regions that encode for genes, so for proteins, in particular genes that are located either on the X chromosome, that is one of the two sexual chromosomes, or that are expressed in the testes. What does it mean? This gives us also information about the past. This gives, this gives us an information that in general, in general, the admixture between Homo sapiens and Neanderthals was not super fertile, was not super good. That's why for important functions, most of our genes are depleted in Neanderthal origin. So the answer is, so when I'm talking about Neanderthal ancestry today in genes related to immunity, neural development, these are the ones who survive that. Because in general, the admixture between the two was not good. We didn't but, fit. Exactly. But the ones that today, the regions today, we observe that are enriched in Neanderthal ancestry can be, due, can be due to two things. Either being Neanderthal in that part of the genome didn't change anything, so we don't care. So that's why it was tolerated. Or that was being Neanderthal for that particular part of our genomes was even better than being sapiens. So these were the regions that survived today and we still observed in our genomes that they are of Neanderthal ancestry. Um, so to make this clear, when we mixed with the Neanderthals, our genome was always um, on top As, um, but not in the cases it was not better than ours. Uh, I don't know. What do you mean for better? What I can um, that's not no, that's not the right word. Um, more dominant, maybe. Which one? Uh, that the human uh, Homo sapiens genes were were more dominant than the Neanderthal genes. Well, Homo sapien genes, by definition, were more adaptive, yeah. more adapted, adapted. However, what we have shown in my lab and in many others, including the one of Svante Paabo from Leipzig, that was the one, well, Nobel Prize winner of, of, of the Nobel Prize uh, in 2023, because he was the one who sequenced for the first time in Leipzig the genome of Neanderthals, right? So, and thanks to the work of Svante Babo from Leipzig, many labs, including mine, have been able to work. So all this to tell you, this long story was just to tell you that in general, what was better, quote, quote, was being sapiens. But for some particular genes and for some particular uh, functions, the introgression that we call of Neanderthal material in our genomes was even better. So we are the product of 200,000 years of adaptation to our environment as Homo sapiens. And we adapt, adapt to that environment even through... Um, mingling with other human groups. Absolutely. Why is there no... Or no. Why aren't there there's many more differences in Homo sapiens, which are living today, uh, around the world? Because we, as Homo sapiens, we are living in different um, geological uh, areas in this world. And one would think that 
in a race which is living in so different uh, geological environments, there would be much bigger changes. Why isn't that the case? Because we are very recent as a species. 200,000 years of adaptation is nothing. We don't have time to accumulate too many differences. But still, we have a tiny, a tiny fraction of our genome is different. Let's take very kind of iconic examples, skin pigmentation. Skin pigmentation is different simply because we had to adapt to live in different latitudes with different UV lights. So in, in, in lower latitudes in Africa, for example, you need to have lots of melanin uh, so to be darker to protect yourself from photo damage. On the contrary, as you migrate to northern latitudes, you need to lose melanin because when there's much less UV light to synth synthesize vitamin D that you need to live, you need to lose your, your pigmentation because there's less UV light and you have to profit as much as you can to synthesize vitamin D. This is just one example of little differences. Other little differences that are related to the different ecological environments in which populations live is even related to, to, to the resistance to some pathogens, some mutations in some interference, interference or molecules that allow us to react and defend ourselves from viruses have been differently selected between Asian populations and Europeans and Africans. Also other mutations that allow us to digest milk in adulthood have, dif have been differently selected in different populations. Still, to answer to your question, the reason why we are not super different in terms of genetic changes is because in terms of evolutionary timescales, 200,000 years is nothing. We are not so old yet. Exactly. Um, th that the thing with the lactose intolerance is pretty interesting because I, I'm a North European. Yeah, I'm from Germany. And I didn't even know that people existed that could not tolerate drinking milk until late into my adulthood. I actually met someone in Karlau, where I'm working actually today, who cannot drink milk. And I could hardly comprehend that. But then I learned that there are up to 90% of humans in Africa and East Asia, human populations, who cannot tolerate milk. And that's sure. still baffling to me. Yeah, because our kind of natural state, our normal quote-unquote state, is not being able to drink milk in adulthood. To be able to drink milk, you need an enzyme that is going to help you to metabolize the lactose, that is the sugar that is present in the milk. The lactose, uh, it has to be broken to be able to be absorbed by the body. So who broke the lactose? This molecule that is called the lactase, right? The problem is that in most humans, the lactase disappear after the period of breastfeeding, of weaning, right? Mm -hmm. So, uh, of course, babies, by definition, all of them digest milk. But then when you become a young adult, you lose the lactase. So in theory, you cannot keep on drinking milk. There's two ways to, to, to adapt to that. There's a biological genetic way that is that some of us in Europe, in certain parts of Africa, in certain parts of South Asia, like India, we have different mutations around this gene that is called the lactase. And these mutations make that some of us can keep on drinking milk. In Europe, there is 
specific European mutation that is present around in around 40% of people in Southern Europe and up to 90% of people in Northern Europe that have this mutation. So these people can keep on drinking milk. But not all is about genetics. You can also culturally adapt and you can ferment yourself the milk, change culturally dairy products, and instead of drinking milk, transforming the milk into yogurt, transforming, transforming the milk into cheese. And in this case, the lactose is broken already. So you don't need the mutation and you can eat that pro those products. The French know a lot of cheese about cheese as well. Right. <laughs> uh, you talked about culture and I would be interested in how does culture influence genetic diversity? In many ways. Uh, I just gave you an example of how culture can affect genetic diversity because human populations until around 10,000 years ago were all hunter-gatherers. Uh, our food was based on what we were hunting or the products that we could um, gather from the, from the nature. But then agriculture appeared And also with agriculture, the domestication of animals. So this is a cultural innovation. With the domestication of animals, milk was starting to be more uh, available. And it was, it was in that moment that natural selection selected the mutation that allow us today to drink milk, for example. This is an example of coevolution of a cultural innovation and a biological trait. But there's other much more basic uh, examples. For example, humans have tended during history to uh, marry humans that were speaking the same language, right? Uh, so during most of our history, We have admixed it, we have married, and we have had children with humans that were speaking the same language. Therefore, linguistic differences between humans historically have imposed a kind of genetic barrier, right? People you didn't used to admix with people that were not speaking the same language. This is an example of how culture, even religion, religion historically people used to mate with people of the same religion mm. of course in the last hundreds of years things have changed a lot but i'm talking at the level of our history so also religion have imposed some borders some barriers for people to mate and of course it still happens today i'm glad you talked about marriage and culture Because the next question is about marriage. So is a monogamy a good choice for humanity um, if you want to cultivate genetic diversity? Would it be better to have a polyamorous humanity? No, I, I think, I think um, you are mixing... Um, monogamy by more uh, I mean uh, how do you say um, oh I have now a, a black hole in my mind it's not monogamy I'm poly polygyny or polyamorous polygamy it's polygamy no, yeah no it's not this uh, what you're talking I think is uh, most societies are exogamous meaning that you, te you tend to marry people that are not of your family, right? People that are different from you, biologically and genetic. But there are some traditional societies where, where endogamy, that's the word, 
endogamy is encouraged. There are some traditional societies, for example, in North Africa or the Middle East, where it's even encouraged to marry your cousins. No, so, no, no. I I know what you, what you mean, but I'm talking about the part in your book where you write about um, this culture of marriage. Um, that 17 percent of the human societies are living in monogamy and a bigger part is having this culture of polygamy so i'm trying to make a joke question <laughs> okay so is it better for the diversity of the human genome to marry a lot of people or I, is it better to live uh, in a monogamic state As long as the people you marry, if we are one, regardless of if it's one or various, are sufficiently different, genetically speaking, from you, that's fine. What is better to avoid is endogamy. Okay. Sure. So endogamy or cultural endogamy is when some tr more traditional societies uh, encourage that people marry within the family, like with cousins or first or two degree uh, cousins. So in the end, this makes that there is a certain uh, decrease of the genetic diversity of the children because you are marrying people that is too similar from you. And this can have, in the, long, in the shorter and longer term, uh, some... Uh, not so good consequences for your health. I think the Sp Spanish part of your ancestry can account for that because the Habsburger chin is mm. of course, famous well, for this. The, the Habsburg uh, cheek or chin, yeah, or, or even more generally, the, the history of royal families in the 20th century in Europe eh? Let me give you an example of how endogamy can be bad. Uh, Queen Victoria of the United Kingdom, uh, she, um, she had uh, uh, many children, and uh, that's why she was called the, the grandmother of Europe at the time, because she married all her daughters and, uh, and uh, two other royal families in Europe, from Germany, from Russia. One of her daughters was married with the Tsar Nicholas II, and also from Spain. So what happens is that uh, she was um, she uh, had the um, a mutation uh, that is associated with hemophilia. You know, hemophilia. Women are just, are just they just harbor the mutation, but they don't suffer from that but they suffer from the, the disease, the males. So what happened is that without realizing, she spread the hemophilia gene to several families of Europe. The Hess in, in Germany, the Romanov in Russia, and the Bourbon in Spain. And, that's, and some of them die of that. Yeah, um, I can remember that when I learned about genetics in my school in Germany. This history of the hemophilia in the royal families in Europe was how my bio biology teacher um, explained mm -hmm. how gene genetics work, how the women are a um, uh, carrier of the, this gene and the next generation, uh, especially the male children, will always die early because they are bleeders in the end. Exactly. Maybe there are other adaptations and mutations uh, that come to mind which helped humans survive in the last 200,000 years, which are especially um, important to you. Yeah, for example, one kind of adaptation where my lab has been very actively working on is 
mutations that Europeans we acquired through a mixture with Neanderthals. And today, these mutations, uh, well, and this, we acquire these mutations from Neanderthals because these mutations allow us to have uh, an increased adaptation to viruses in particular. So this is something that we showed uh, that uh, some of our mutations today uh, that are associated with responses to virus, such as influenza virus, but even SARS-CoV-2, these mutations are coming from uh, Neanderthals. And this is a kind of adaptation that I found somehow interesting because that shows that when the first Europeans came from Africa, they were not adapted probably to the viruses of Europe. But the Neanderthals, they were adapted because they were living in Europe for 300,000 years. So that shows how a mixture is a good way to grab from the others, Neanderthals in this case, mutations that are adaptive mutations. Mm -hmm. And we acquire it in order for us sapiens to survive the new virus we're founding uh, when we get into Europe. So while we had the pandemic of COVID-19, was it better to have one or three percent Neanderthal genes? Or was it uh, a poisoned gift? Both. Some, for sure. All the mutations that we acquired from Neanderthals at the time, so 40,000 years ago, were advantages. But there has been changes in, in, as we were talking before, in terms of maladaptation. So with respect to the particular case of the COVID-19 pandemic, um, Zvante Paabo, for example, showed very nicely how some mutations are good today, Some Neanderthal mutations that are present in our genomes today allow us to be more resistant to severe COVID-19. But in other cases, it's a poison gift because other Neanderthal mutations that are also present in our genomes today increase the severity of COVID-19. So that's the thing of biology. Not all is black and white. Is complex and evolution change over time. What it was advantageous 40,000 years ago is not necessarily advantageous today. So, where are the limits of human adaptations, considering we will need to adapt in a world of changing climate? Well, uh, for that, There's different ways to adapt. There's technological, cultural things that we can do, like uh, be very uh, careful with our environment, be very responsible of what we are doing. This is nothing to do with biology and genetics. This is a way to adapt somehow because preventing or diminishing as much as we can By being responsible and being environmentally friendly, it's a way that women, who, um, humans, we can do to survive. Uh, and also, should the environment change a lot in the next hundreds or thousands of years, uh, we might adapt also to, to those changes. But evolution is extremely slow. And to adapt biologically or genetically to environmental changes, this takes thousands of years. You as geneticist, what do you think are the greatest threats to humankind? Well, the greatest threats, um, that's a very difficult question. But I think the as a geneticist a threat is populations that are very isolated populations that are very small and populations that do not admix with other populations isolation 
an inbreeding, meaning not mix it or mating with people outside, in the longer run, makes that the population will uh, lose the capacity to adapt and survive. Uh, so that's a bigger threat for us humans, some populations of humans, but also from any other population of, of animals or plants, right? Uh, isolation uh, is never a good thing. Yeah, inbreeding is dangerous for your health. Absolutely. What did you learn about human nature by studying our genome and its history? Well, what not me, but the community of geneticists and biologists in general, what we have learned by studying the genome diversity of different populations is that most of the genetic differences that you observed are not between human populations or within each population, just between two individuals. So, but if you take different populations from Africa, from Europe, from Asia, the genetic differences are, are tiny, as we were saying before, are minor, which, at least from a biological or genetic perspective, abolish the, the, the sense of different races, right? Because different races, you find them in dogs. What does it mean? That if you compare a German shepherd with a bird or with a chihuahua, they are extremely different, genetically speaking. That's a race. Whereas in humans, if you compare somebody from Senegal, somebody from Germany, and somebody from China, the genetic differences are minor. So they are not races. We have just one race, that is the humans. I had this feeling of an abrupt ending to your book. Um, I felt like uh, there has to be more. There's more to tell. Yes, I thought that's that can't be it. So maybe I'm ending this with the questions: Where, where do we go from here in this odyssey? I think uh, we go to understanding much more in depth uh, how we have adapted to the environment, but not with simple, very very simple questions like the one we have learned and we have talked today, like a particular mutation, two or three mutations that allow people to digest milk as adults, uh, around 20 genes that are involved in our different physical appearance in terms of skin pigmentation. But I think we have still a lot to learn from our past, And particularly with ancient DNA, the, the field of paleogenomics, that is the sequencing of genomes from uh, populations that have lived in the past. And by sequencing these genomes, I think we will learn a lot of how populations, for example, in the past survived the Black Death, how populations in the past have adapted to pathogens. And in Germany, you have wonderful scientists you, doing, doing that. You have Johannes Krause, for example, in Leipzig, that is a worldwide renowned expert in paleogenomics and infectious diseases. So I think this is, is, this is a very a promising um, uh, area of research. Thank you very much. Do you have a message for my listeners? A message to the audience, you mean? Yeah. Sure. My message would be that by reading my book, the ones that decide to read my book, I hope that they will be convinced that diversity, whether genetic, that is what I focus uh, on my book, but also 
Cultural diversity is our future. Without diversity, without embracing diversity, our species will come to an end. Thank you very much. Um, I can attest to that after reading this book that uh, humans should not be afraid of migration, even if there are problems that have to be solved with people on the move en masse. That's a given in human history. But um, I learned that the Homo sapiens survived because it was so diverse in it in his or her genetic um, makeup, and that's how we made it so far. And if we do not uh, learn from that history, we will be doomed to uh, doomed to the end of what happened to the Neanderthals, and that's they are gone. And I do not that's want that. Not what we want. That's not it. So uh, maybe I will be calling this uh, podcast episode "Diversité se ma divise. I'm sorry, I'm butchered the French language, but I think you understood it. Sure. So I thank you very much, and I hope everybody who has listened to this will be reading your book. I will put it in the show notes, and uh, yeah. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much, Jenny. Bye, Luz. Bye-bye. Sorry? Wait.